When you're working with a client who's trying to put a little more physical activity in their lives, one of the most common problems is called ambivalence. Because they're coming to see you and they're willing to talk to you about it, there's clearly some reasons why they would like to exercise. But because they haven't started already, there's clearly some reasons why they haven't done it by themselves without your help. So ambivalence is when you have reasons for and against. Sometimes some people use the word resistance because of those reasons against, but 99% of the time clients come because they're ambivalent, because they've got both reasons for and against, and at the moment that makes them feel stuck. The question today is what do you do to try to help clients who are feeling ambivalent? For a long time, I thought that the approach was to try to help convince them about the reasons for exercise, try to increase the number of pros that they saw, which meant giving them lots of information about the benefits of exercise, but also to amplify those cons, to help them identify all of the risks to their health or the problems that might be wrong with their current approach and the reasons why they should exercise instead of their current sedentary behavior, helping them learn about those risks as a way of trying to help change that balance. The problem with this approach of education to try to kind of maybe lecture people about the benefits or to sort of make them feel guilty about the, the problems with their current behavior is it can feel pretty pressuring and controlling. It can feel a lot like I'm the expert giving you the information and you kind of have to do what I suggest for your health, right? Now, what we've learned in the past is that being really pressuring and controlling doesn't really increase long-term motivation. It can make people feel kind of controlled. And while that might work a little bit, it doesn't really in the long-term help people's well-being or their behaviors. We also know that the process of feeling controlled doesn't help build a sense of connection with the other person. And so maybe there's another way, maybe there's some another way that you can try to help resolve this ambivalence without you having to be the person who gives the lecture. As further evidence that being lectured doesn't necessarily lead to positive behavior change, there's been quite a few randomized trials that have looked at sort of scare tactic approaches. There's been Scared Straight, which was a program designed to scare adolescent offenders to stop them going to prison. So they put them in a prison environment and really tried to scare the sort of uh, crime out of them per se. The problem was when they did randomized trials, they found that people were less likely to go to prison if you did nothing. They were more likely to go back to prison after the Scared Straight program. The same things happened after alcohol abuse. People who were, say, in drink driving accidents were more likely to have another drink driving accident when they were confronted with their uh, victims of their, their accident. And so the emotion, that guilt that comes from, and the fear that comes from being in these sort of scare or guilt-inducing situations can often lead to more of the unhelpful behavior in the long run. But as you know, one or two randomized trials isn't enough to be able to determine causation by itself. So today, we're gonna just quickly touch on a meta-analysis about a different approach to managing ambivalence and then talk about how to implement the technique that's in this meta-analysis. So the strategy that we're gonna talk about this week is called motivational interviewing. It's not about trying to make the other person motivated, but it's about trying to evoke motivation from the other person to see if they can help resolve their own ambivalence with you as a coach. The meta-analysis this week is pretty straightforward. They looked at trials that tried to use motivational interviewing to promote physical activity in people with like chronic health conditions like MS or obesity or who are overweight. They looked at a number of outcomes, but the main one was, was there an increase in people's physical activity from being involved in a motivational interviewing program compared to not getting any sort of specific motivational interviewing? What they found is across all of the studies that they included, on average, there was a small positive significant effect of being in a motivational interviewing intervention, meaning where you had a practitioner who was trained in these strategies that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Now the good news from your perspective is it didn't have to be a psychologist or a doctor who was providing the motivational interviewing. Any well-trained health professional can do the intervention and lead to good outcomes based on this meta-analysis and a number of the papers that they cite in the discussion. The other thing that's really important to consider though is that some of these studies were really good at their motivational interviewing and made sure that the health practitioners were doing MI correctly and some of them weren't paying as much attention to how uh, faithfully people were following the intervention. So the reason this is important is that when they compared the studies that were using motivational interviewing faithfully, they ended up having bigger effect sizes than the 
people in the health professionals who weren't necessarily monitored or trained as well. This is important because it means that just giving motivational interviewing doesn't necessarily mean you get good outcomes. You have to be kind of doing it using the spirit of motivational interviewing, using the techniques correctly, and doing it in a supervised and trained kind of environment. It's pretty hard to learn motivational interviewing just by watching videos like this, but today we're gonna to give you a whirlwind tour of the four main things that you need to know to be able to get a basic understanding of how motivational interviewing works. The first one is the spirit of motivational interviewing. The second one is what are the different styles that are fundamental to motivational interviewing. The third, is the acronym AWS, which are the fundamental strategies that are involved in the guiding style of motivational interviewing. And the fourth part is the natural progression of a session and the foundational framework that can help you structure the way that you work with a client. So the first thing to understand is the spirit of motivational interviewing because it's kind of core to the rest of the process. If you implement the techniques without embodying the spirit of the intervention, that's when you start to drift off protocol and as we saw that leads to lower levels of physical activity. There's a lot of acronyms in motivational interviewing and so the first one is this rule acronym. And I'll walk through what the four different parts of it are. The R stands for resisting the writing reflex. So any health practitioner has a lot of knowledge about the domain in which they're trained, more so than the client. And this can often mean that there's this reflex when a client says something that isn't quite in line with what you think to kind of correct the client and make sure that they're right. This is called the writing reflex. It means sort of this process of automatically trying to fix what's going on or correct the information that's there. And what can happen is it can end up with a bit of tug of war. You try to pull them one way, they pull back and end up actually digging their heels in more. This can happen with any health profession. As you can see from say this referral from a doctor who's put some really clear directions for a client who's struggling with a drug addiction. And you can imagine how well this works. So resisting the writing reflex means to just try to take it a little bit slower on the giving of information to clients. If they're saying something that's not quite right, yes, there are ways of providing information, but the first thing is to go through the other parts of the spirit of motivational interviewing, and then you might be able to correct some misconceptions. So. And the next part is what's called understanding the client's motivations. A lot of the time us as health practitioners know a lot of reasons why a person should change their behavior. But instead of giving those reasons to the client, we're trying to draw the reasons out of the client. They've got reasons to be with you in the first place. And so this strategy allows you to draw their motivations out. To help understand what these principles are in a really concrete manner, we're going to try to integrate some clips from different interviews and highlight some of the good and not so good strategies as far as the spirit and the techniques in motivational interviewing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we probably have to work out a way where you know you, you can kind of get someone to look after your kids and so you can do some more exercise because exercise is... Well, who would I know. get to look after? Like well, I guess that's probably something that um, you can work out. I guess my job, as I said at the start, is probably to really work with you to get you doing more exercise. Um, and look, there's a lot of kind of interesting things that I know about exercise that I think it's really important for you to be doing. In that video, you can see that the expert is trying to just give the client what the expert thinks the client needs. Take a look at the second example and see how this uses the client's motivations instead. Maybe we could start a little bit about um, you telling me about why you're here. What what is it that you hope to get out of this interaction? So once you've got the client's motivations in this way, you're more likely to leverage their own intrinsic reasons that makes them feel more autonomous, like they're doing it for their own reasons rather than for yours, rather than feeling pressured or controlled. But to be able to do this properly, we really need to be able to listen with empathy, which is the L in the rule acronym. So if you have a look at this little clip, you can see how the client shares something that might be a little bit distressing and notice how the practitioner, who's wonderful in this case, happens to just try to slow down and just be with the client and listen to them non-judgmentally. Yeah, because I've been trying to get to know people at uni, but I'm second year now, so all of them already have their little group of friends, and I'm kind of just someone new that no one wants to go near at the moment because they don't know me yet, so. Mm -hmm. That sounds hard. It sounds sort of a bit isolating. A bit... Yeah, yeah. Okay. The final part of the acronym is E for empowering the client. Empowering them to take action and make as many decisions as possible, giving them some independence and autonomy in the process. 
Watch this part of an interview and see who you think is in charge of what's going on in this relationship. Who's driving it? Who's setting the goals or the targets? Um, five days a week, moderate exercise. I think we'll do things um, that most people like to do are like getting on the treadmill. Um, maybe we can change that up and do like running outside a little bit and things like that. Um, I don't know if I want to run outside. Okay, well we can run inside um, on the treadmill. I don't treadmill. Know if I want to run. Okay, well, like running on a treadmill is, you know, it's really good for you and, and it's probably, you know, the thing that's going to get you the most outcomes. So that's probably a good option for us. Um, now compare that with this example and see who is in the driving seat here. See what the purpose is of this part of the discussion. I, I'm, I'm happy to provide you with ideas about what we do and things like that. Um, but at the same time, I'd really like us to almost work as a team. Um, and maybe in doing that, what I could do is, is come with a few suggestions of what we might do, and then you could maybe lead the decision-making process of that. But yeah, I think it'd be really good as if, you know, I can come with some suggestions, yes. but then I'd really like you to try to drive some of those things. Because I think if it's, if it's something that you own, it's something that, that you'll really push. Okay. Um, so as you can see, on one hand, you might have a health practitioner who's really trying to drive and push and be in charge of the situation, and another who's just a guide on the side, who's just trying to be a coach providing some suggestions, but isn't necessarily the one trying to push so much. This empowering process means that the client can be more self-determined and self-driven than when you've got someone who's really in charge of the situation. I've talked about guiding a few times so far, and I wanna talk about Guiding is one of the three styles that are used in motivational interviewing. The first style, the one that a lot of health practitioners resort to or that are kind of used as part of their writing reflex is directing. This is where you're in front. Have a look at this clip again and see how the health practitioner is the one directing the conversation. I don't know um, if I want to run outside. Okay, well we can run inside um, on the treadmill. I don't know if I want to run. Okay, well like running on a treadmill is, you know, it's really good for you and, and it's probably you know the thing that's going to get you the most outcomes so that's probably a good option for us um, sometimes directing is appropriate when a client explicitly wants some help with something or is really motivated and just needs some direction then directing is naturally the style to go to but in other times when a client's ambivalent you pushing means that they will push back one approach to managing this is what's called following Following is where you don't push at all, you just follow where the client goes. So take a look at this example and notice how the client brings up something difficult and watch how the health practitioner follows where they're going. So it's been a big move, is it? Yeah. Can you tell me a bit about what the transition's been like? Like what else has been different? Yeah. When a client brings up something difficult like this, following is a really good approach. It's not good on its own though, because if you just follow the client wherever they're going, it doesn't necessarily help them get somewhere new. They probably are on the same pattern that they've been going on for a while, and it doesn't allow you to provide any direction. So is there a way of balancing these two, where you're not just following where the client goes, but you're not also just directing and pushing the whole conversation? That's where guiding fits in. Have a look at this clip and see if you can see the difference between directing and following and how it's sort of somewhere in between. Cold and dark. Yeah, so cold, frigid, dark mornings yeah. are pretty unmotivated, yeah. right? Okay. Well, some of the things when people are in similar situations to you, I know a few people who try to put a bit of incidental exercise into mm -hmm. their kind of commute. So they're either walking a little bit to public transport or riding a bike or including a jog part of the way home. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering whether any of those ideas have, have come up for you or any of those sort of appeal? I haven't thought about that really, but I probably could. So one way to look at guiding is it's about providing suggestions while allowing the client to make the ultimate decision. It's giving options and then giving them a chance to take the action because eventually they're always going to be the one who has to take action. It's different from directing because you're not out in front just pushing where to go and making the relationship go in a certain direction and it's not like following where you're just letting the client go wherever they want. Instead, guiding is a process a little bit like being a rock climbing guide. You're not on the wall necessarily with them. You've got a different perspective 
and you're able to see some options that they might not be able to see by themselves. But ultimately, they're the one who decides where they put their foot, where they put their hand, and whether to climb it or... Typically, in MI, we're using these three different strategies depending on the context, but guiding is our default. Sometimes we need to follow a client like when they're distressed or we're just meeting a client, and sometimes we need to direct like when they just really want some instructions about how to do something. But a lot of the time, we want to have the spirit of motivational interviewing, which is most embodied in guiding because you're understanding their motivations, you're listening to them, um, and you're not really in the writing reflex directing mode. You're just providing nudges and helping to empower them to make the decisions. So to understand guiding, there's another acronym which will help you remember some of the key skills that are involved in this process, and that's AWS. Open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summarizations. So many people are familiar with open-ended questions already, but let's start by taking a look at the way that some health practitioners might begin a session. Do you exercise? Um, yeah, I do a little bit, like once, once or twice a week. Okay, once or twice a week, all right. Um, so when you ask questions in this way, you'll often get quite terse, short answers that don't necessarily allow the client to t expand on their motivations or talk about some of their reasons or really dig into where their confidence is, etc. You just end up with usual yes, no answers. And in very rare cases, this is okay. But when you're starting with a client and you're trying to explore some of their motivations and their ambivalence, it's better to try open-ended questions like this one. Maybe we could start a little bit about um, you telling me about why you're here. What, what is it that you hope to get out of this interaction? So in general, try to avoid questions like do you or have you or are you, and instead ask things like what, when, where, how, how do you feel about that sort of approach, or what do you think of that idea? Okay, this allows for more elaboration and more expansion from the client. The A stands for affirmation, which is a process of just briefly noticing and affirming a client's change talk, which is their maybe belief or their reasons for change, their belief in their own abilities or some of the, the ideas about why they want to make a change. So you can see maybe in this clip how the practitioner tries to notice the client's intentions to step forward and just provide a little bit of encouragement for that process. That sounds fantastic. So, I mean, that would help get things moving at the moment. Mm -hmm. With affirmations, you never want to get ahead of the client and provide too much praise because then sometimes their negative self-talk can come back and it can have the opposite effect. But just briefly noting their belief in themselves or their progress does help at least acknowledge that and place a little bit more emphasis and maybe gets them to elaborate on it a bit. Another strategy for encouraging elaboration on a topic is what's called reflection. It also is a very good way of communicating that you're listening to a client. It's easy to say, I understand how you feel about this, but it's different to say something like this. Um, but variety is probably good. Okay, yeah. so you'd like a little bit of variety, yeah. like maybe, maybe put forward some suggestions about yes. what that might be. Um, and also it sounds like we need to take into consideration previous injuries. Contrast that with the way that this health practitioner shows that they're listening. Smart goals. Uh, you might not have heard of smart goals before, so I um, so we're talking about uh, specific, measurable, um, action-oriented, realistic, and time-based. So specific. So it's clearly not good to talk over a client when they're talking to you. But one of the best ways to show that you're listening is to actually take what the client says, put it in your own words, and send it back. As you can see from the first example, the practitioner skillfully takes what they say, synthesizes it into two main points around variety and injuries, and then feeds it back to the client to check their understanding. The last AWS skill is called a summarization, and this is like a big version of a reflection. What it does is it takes maybe things that have been said over the last couple of minutes or the whole session and feeds it back to the client. It often starts with something like, uh, let me check that I've understood what you've said so far, or can I just check in and see where we're at. But it doesn't have to. It can be quite dynamic, but it's a process of almost reflecting what's been said over a longer period of time. There's a, there's a few things sort of going on, but one of the, the main things is around the time factor, that yeah. even if there was space in, in teams, yeah, it'd be, there'd be some social discomfort in going to a new group. Mm -hmm. um, but even just finding the time between work and uni and, yeah. and making friends in other ways, it, it sounds like that would be really hard. Yeah. And when it comes to running, what are sort of the barriers or the things that are stopping you there? 
So the practitioner here takes what's been said so far in the interview and summarizes all of the things that are going on, some of the barriers or the things that are getting in the way for this client, and then uses it as a segue to dive into the next question, the next part of the interview about looking at specific strategies. So summarizations are good for that. They're good for wrapping up any section. It's good for moving from one section to a next. It's good for starting a session, maybe summarizing the previous session, or it's good at the end of a session just to help the client feel like they've been understood and heard. And lastly, it's okay to check that to see if you're on the right track. If you've missed a part from the summarization, you might be going in the wrong direction, but it's okay to ask the client, are we on the right track here? You contrast this with a reflection, which is usually said as more of a sentence. Uh, reflections finish with like a downward tone. It's like, okay, so one of the main things we've got to do is uh, help manage your injuries. It's not, can we manage your injuries, yeah? Like you try not to finish with a question at the end because uh, it sort of interrupts the conversation. Reflections sound more like sentences, but summarizations, because they're summarizing quite a bit of content, it's good to check in and see whether it's accurate. So those are the four ORS skills, open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. And those are the crucial skills when you're trying to use guiding because they allow the client to talk quite openly about what's going on. It allows you to show that you're listening and that puts you in the best position to provide any nudges or suggestions. The last part of motivational interviewing that we're gonna to choose to talk about in this video is the process of a session, the four steps that you move forward and back in between, okay? But they have to be done in this order because otherwise you can end up with some sessions that feel a little bit too pushy like this one. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Um, look, I'm, I'm an exercise uh, professional and, and really what I do is, is prescribe exercise. Um, so what I'm here to do today is to, to give you some exercise um, to, to kind of improve your life. So this practitioner is pushing for change before they've even had a chance to get to know the client. The, the client may not feel really understood or listened to in this situation at all. So this is why MI suggests four stages. We've got engaging, focusing, then we want to move into evoking and finally planning. This practitioner probably jumped too quickly into things like planning when really the first thing you want to do is engage someone in the process. Get to know them a little bit. Ask some personal questions that just help you understand them as a person like these health practitioners do. How old are your children? They are four and two. Four and two, wow. Incredible ages, hey? Yeah, very busy. Right, okay. Yeah. So what's life look like? What's this busyness look like? And tell me a bit about yourself. What does a day look like for you at the moment? It's only once you've had a chance to build rapport in this way that you should start to focus on a specific problem or a specific goal. Really what you want to do is after you've built rapport, then focus on setting an agenda like this. Maybe we could start a little bit about um, you telling me about why you're here. What, what is it that you hope to get out of this interaction? You can see that collaboratively focusing the session in this way allows the rest of the session to make more sense because you're both working towards a common goal. But if you don't do any engaging first, how do you know if this is a common goal or one that you've set for them? So the first part is engaging to try to help understand what the client kind of wants. And then the second part is to naturally move that into a focusing process where you talk about a specific area of their life that they want to improve. Um, and exercise was a part of your life and it's something you've thought about perhaps bringing back yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And so what are the things you thought about doing? Once you've got a focus, then the next part's called evoking. And evoking refers to drawing out of the client their motivations, including both how confident they are that they can change this and how important it is for them to change it. These two are important because both confidence and importance lead to motivation. And so drawing it out of the client often gets them bringing out some positive self-talk around maybe their past successes, or it provides some hypotheticals in ways that they might succeed in the future. Alternatively, you look for their own reasons for wanting to change, their desires from coming to this program. So have a look at these two examples of ways of providing confidence as well as maybe some importance, but drawing it out of the client. And if there were spaces in teams, how would that influence your decision? I think if I could fit it in, mm. then I, I probably would think about it. Um, what specifically do you want to achieve? Um, some weight loss, mm -hmm. um, strength stuff, mm -hmm. flexibility stuff. Okay, all right. Yeah. This, I mean, this Being is good for me. Sit down on the ground with the kids and get up without 
creaking and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, These four processes build on each other, which means sometimes you end up going back and forth. But you don't want to go higher until you've got a solid foundation. So as you can see in this example, sometimes it's appropriate to go back to focusing to make sure you focus on a really specific part of the process instead of continuing to go up and plan something without having an even clearer focus. Can we focus on maybe one of those today? Out of the, you talked about weight loss, strength, yep. um, you know, kind of being able to get up off the ground, so we've got that yep. agility. Um, just for the purposes of today, maybe which one of those three could we, is most important for you at the moment? Again, there are times when you might have to go back to the engaging phase. If you say something that might offend a client or you might feel like you're pushing too hard, then it's okay to go back and try to build rapport so you've got a solid foundation before you focus again and then keep evoking. At this point in evoking, it's okay to provide a little bit of information because doing so can either raise some options the client hadn't thought of, help build their confidence or their importance a little bit, as you can see here. Well, some of the things when people are in similar situations to you, I know a few people who try to put a bit of incidental exercise into mm -hmm. their kind of commute. So they're either walking a little bit to public transport or riding a bike or including a jog part of the way home. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering whether any of those ideas have, have come up for you or any of those sort of appeal? I haven't thought about that really, but I probably could. So the top of this process is planning, and that's at the top because you need to have a solid foundation for all of the other strategies first. The most common mistake that health practitioners make is they jump into planning before they've done any engaging or focusing or evoking. So this is where you start to talk about what, when, and where they might change their behavior, but even this, to be consistent with motivational interviewing, is best if it comes out of the client. We'll do um, five days a week, moderate exercise, I think we'll do things um, that most people like to do are like getting on the treadmill, um, maybe we can change that up and do like running outside a little bit and things like that. When you push a goal onto a client in this way, without having done the engaging and focusing, you can see that they're less likely to buy into it. Do you think this client's really going to go away and do five times a week? Instead, watch what happens if you try to draw the goal out of the client. Realistically for you then, if you're currently doing one day of exercise a week, yep. and there's this idea that you need to do more exercise, yep. how many extra days can you, do you think you can fit an exercise in your week? Um, well, from what I understand is I should be doing it more. So I think I should be doing it three. Now we've got something that might be much more realistic for the client to take away themselves and do. This is the real goal at the end of a session is to try to come up with some sort of clear plan, but only once you've done enough to try to engage and evoke motivation from the client so that they're keen to do it. So all of these steps use the ORS skills of open-ended questions, reflections, affirmations, summary. You might use a summary, for example, between each session or an affirmation after they provide some change talk when you try to evoke some motivation from them. They usually rely on the guiding style, but sometimes you'll oscillate between following and planning. You're more likely to follow when you're trying to engage. Maybe you're more likely to direct when you're in the planning stage. So all of the skills and all of the styles happen in these different stages quite dynamically. But the most important thing is to remember that overall approach to motivational interviewing. You want to make sure that you resist the writing reflex. You don't jump too quickly into planning or directing style. At every stage, you want to make sure that you're understanding the client's motivations for being here rather than pushing your own in there with the writing reflex. You want to use the listening skills so that you can listen with empathy in the present moment to the client. Make sure you're reflecting what they say and summarizing the things that they've said so far. And finally, by drawing motivation out of the client rather than kind of trying to jam it in, you're empowering the client to make their own decisions. You're giving them choices by guiding rather rather than necessarily pushing them in any certain direction. And you can see a lot of this creates an autonomy supportive environment that helps build a close connection to the client. It's not simple or easy, this process. So it takes a lot of practice and deliberate training to help make sure that you're reflecting and coming across non-judgmentally. It's also not just non-judgmental listening because there's a clear goal here, a clear focus and a clear guiding style, which is different to just listening and following the whole time. If you can strike a balance between these two approaches, then as we've seen, you're able to have a significant influence on someone's 
physical activity through the relationship that you build with them. The more you're able to embody the spirit of motivational interviewing and stick to the processes that have been described, the higher the effects here, that you can end up having really moderate effect sizes. But overall, any health practitioner can learn how to do this. And if you can use these skills with your clients, you'll be able to build a close relationship where the client feels empowered and confident about their own abilities.